the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. Let us pray. <coughs> o Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owned him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. <coughs> then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you 
if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Where were you when you got the news? I've asked that question in sermons before, and I've always found the reactions interesting. Some people think I'm talking about Pearl Harbor. Some think of the Kennedy assassination. Others, the Challenger explosion. But certainly fresh in our minds are the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Where were you when you got the news? Didn't we all feel a collective kick in the gut? Certain that this kind of thing could never happen here, we watched on television and saw it replayed over and over and over again. I was sitting in my office when I got the news. My secretary called and said she would be a little bit late this morning because a plane had just flown into the World Trade Center. And as she explained what she had seen, she stopped for a minute, gasped, and said, another one just hit. What did you feel? when you got the news. Rage, anger, fear, certainly all the things that make us wonder, is there a good God in the face of such evil in the world? And what are we to do about it? Certainly in the face of such events, the first thing that comes to mind is revenge. Who did this? Let's get them. And let's do worse to them than they did to us. And so it goes back and forth and back and forth. You kill 10 of mine. I'll kill 20 of yours. I, you kill 30 of mine, I'll kill 50 of yours. And the bloodlust never stops. I read this week of the death of Pastor Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley was a central figure in what the Irish call the Troubles. The fighting, the terrorism that went on between Christians, Christians, Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland. Towards the end of his life, Dr. Paisley had a change of heart. And instead of whipping up hatred among Protestants, he urged the two sides to get together and form a peace, a peace that lasts today. Shaky at times, yes, but a peace nonetheless. He finally came to that point where this ordained pastor decided that peace was better than war, life better than death, healing better than loving. But before he came to that realization, over 4,000 people died in the violence that he fomented. What do we feel, brothers and sisters, when we are wronged? Do we want the one who has wronged us to be punished? Or are we willing to forgive? I read just a little bit of the newspaper this morning where an Amishman had been interviewed about the TV show 
Amish Mafia. And he observed, there is no such thing. We are taught to forgive, not to seek revenge, as it's depicted on Amish Mafia, reality TV. There's nothing real about it. And so this morning we hear words of Jesus that frankly can be hard to hear as we remember the horrible events of September 11th probably the last thing on our minds is forgiveness as we continue to see brutal acts of terrorism in the Middle East and fear that things like that could happen here forgiveness is probably the last thing on our mind And yet, Peter comes with an interesting question. Now remember that what is being talked about here is the community of the church, not world affairs. In world affairs, it seems we'll always be stuck with an us and a them. But do we have it in the church? You bet we do. So Peter comes to Jesus and says, how often should I forgive a brother or sister, a member of the church, if they sin against me? As many as seven times? And Jesus' reply says that there is really no limit to the number of times you should forgive. Some translations, like the one we heard this morning, read 77. Some read 70 times 7. But Jesus is using a familiar phrase that we would recognize as a gazillion times. Your forgiveness is never to end. And that is what is hard. Peter is being generous. The rabbis of the time taught that you must forgive a sister or brother three times before you can sit and wallow in hatred of them. So Peter more than doubles that. Should I forgive as many as seven times? How often have you been forgiven? How often has God looked at the book of your life and decided instead of punishment to wipe away what is there? And to illustrate this, Jesus tells a story. A king is calling to account all of his slaves, all of his servants, who manage his household. And there is one brought to him who owes a whole lot of money. Something around the national debt. And because the man cannot pay, the king orders him with his family to be sold into slavery. And what does the man do? He doesn't plead for forgiveness. He pleads for time. Just just wait a little bit there. By tomorrow, I should have $3 trillion. Not likely to happen. But because the man pleads with him, The king forgives his debt. That means that the king assumes his debt, takes it on himself, and he forgives the man and lets him go. Well, then the forgiven servant goes out and runs into a fellow servant who owes him a buck and a half. 
And he says, hey, you owe me a buck and a half. Pay me now. The other man also asks for time. Be patient with me and I'll repay you. But the first servant says, nope, you owe me. It's into the slammer for you. Did he do anything wrong? According to the law? No. If we don't pay our bills, the electric company will shut off our power. If we don't pay our mortgage, the bank will come and take the house. That's the way the law is. No mention of mercy here. But you see, God is a God of justice and mercy. How do we want that applied to our lives? Certainly, I want mercy from God. I know how far short I fall of what God wants of me. And when my accounting before God comes due, all I can plead is Jesus Christ. Nothing more. Because I can't meet God's expectations. I am a frail, broken human. Try my best as my, I, I might, I will fall short. So I want God to be merciful to me, a poor sinner. But you, I know what you said about me last week. I know what you did. I want God to get you. I want God's justice for you. Justice, mercy. Mercy, justice. Which one do we want? For whom? And which one do we get? We've seen much on TV of the memorial at the site of the World Trade Center, the place where that building once stood, and the names of those who perished when the towers fell. It's a solemn place. I've been to the Flight 93 memorial out in Somerset, it is way, way out in a farm field. You have to take a long trip to find it. But that, too, is a touching place where the names of all the crew and passengers who died stand on stone monuments. Do we forgive those who committed these horrible acts? Are we capable of that? What does God want of us? Yes, Jesus is speaking of the church in this gospel lesson. So to Paul is speaking to the church in what he has to say about getting along and forgiving. And yet, are we not to be the light to the world, to show the world what forgiveness looks like? That forgiveness and not vengeance is what we can do. If judgment is needed, do we trust God to take care of that? Or do we think we have to do it ourselves? I was on vacation a few years ago in the Outer Banks. We were driving over to the aquarium 
And as we drove down this one road, I noticed three little churches, same size, same architecture, same denomination, right next to each other. And I said to my wife, I bet that's a story of church fights, of Christians who could not agree, who could not forgive, but slammed the door behind them and said, you'll miss me when I'm gone because I'm the most important person in this church. Ever heard of that happening? But I think of another church a bigger, older church. Actually, it's a story of two churches. In the city of Coventry in England, there is a beautiful modern cathedral. It's not very old. It was built in the 1950s. Right next to it, stands the old Coventry Cathedral. It had stood for centuries until Nazi bombs burned it. When the decision was being made about the new cathedral, many people wanted the old cathedral completely demolished it was an ugly, burned-out shell. And it was a reminder of a horrible time in the history of the English people. But the decision was made to leave part of it standing. And the part that is still standing gives us this message. The huge soaring arch over the main altar still stands. There is a big charred timber that lays where it fell as the fire burned right across the front of the altar. And in letters of gold on that charred timber you can read Father, forgive. In forgiving each other, we are ourselves forgiven. In lifting the burden of hatred and anger from our own hearts, we become messengers of good news. This morning you heard that your sins are forgiven. Your slate is wiped clean. The trillion dollar debt that you owe God is canceled. And we are called and sent to forgive those who have wronged us that the gospel might be made known. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended in, into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and all of God's creation. 
for the whole church of God, its leaders, missionaries, youth workers, chaplains, pastors, bishops, and all who are baptized. We pray for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, for the congregation of Nativity Lutheran Church, and for the congregation of Trinity Lutheran Church in Wernersville. Help us to proclaim Christ crucified. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For all creation, for seeds that are sown, fields that are harvested, winds that blow, rains that fall, animals that roam, and the fruits of the earth, fill us with thanksgiving for these gifts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For the leaders of this world, presidents, prime ministers, monarchs, parliaments, elected representatives, and heads of corporations, inspire them to do what is right and just, even if it looks foolish. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For all who suffer in mind and body, the bullied and the shamed, the brokenhearted and the beaten down, the sick and the dying, especially those we name before you now. Heal them with the encouragement of the gospel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For the mission of this congregation, its ministries, stewardship, fellowship, outreach, homebound, children, volunteers, staff and council. Make us a beacon of your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In thanksgiving for the blessed dead, those martyred and those who gave themselves in love, those who died alone and those who died tragically, that they, together with all your saints, be lifted up in your glory. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who set us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. O God, the host at every meal, at this table you spread out a feast for all peoples, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters, and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and our Savior. Amen. May God the sower make you good and fertile soil. May Christ the seed bloom and grow in your words and actions. May the fruitful spirit bring forth a bountiful yield in your lives. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.